So I would request all the panelists along with the moderator to please uh, have a seat. Good morning to all. Thanks for being uh, for this morning session. Uh, thanks, Sunil. Uh, before we are going to start this session, we want all of you to be more engaged during the session. And to engage all of you during the session, we are running an app named as Slido. I hope most of you might be knowing about this app. I informed Nand Kumar sir also about this app. I have shared the code with him. What is the app all about? You all have to go to uh, Google and type Slido in your mobile. Just go to Google, type Slido, S-L-I-D-O, Slido. Once you will be typing, you will be reaching a page which is asking for a code. It says slido.com. There will be a code. The code for the session is M, M for Mumbai, 971. M971. The objective of this, uh, uh, to use this app is to engage the audience within themselves as well as with the panelist. So whatever the discussion is going on over here in the panel, the same, uh, you can you know, type your questions, your remarks, your feedback, whatever is in your mindset. We will be showcasing those particular questions over the screen, as well as the same questions will be there in the moderator screen. Uh, he will be reading all those questions. And whatever the interesting question would be there, he will be taking up, might be during the session or after the session. In the meantime, you can also share your, uh, you know, consent about the uh, session and the same will be highlighted over the screen, the middle of the screen. I hope this is done. I mean, the code is M471. Yeah, M471. So we are going to start the session. M for money, M for Mumbai or money. 471. If anyone is having any problem, I, I, I'm nearby. But this is going to be a, a because we have tested this yesterday, and it was very, it was very effective. There was a great questionnaire which was shared through the audience. Even a connect between the audience was there. So uh, we can use this uh, platform to have kind of discussion among the audience only. So we are going to start the session now. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, great to uh, be here on the start of the second day of this conference and uh, take up very interesting topic of engineering security in payment innovations. I'm going to treat the word engineering as a verb so that it is uh, not just a descriptor but a action oriented word which will drive the discussions. <coughs> uh, I have a distinguished panel with me and uh, the preparatory activities for today's panel have uh, enriched already our own understanding of payment innovations happening in India and uh, then obviously the security aspects and so on. So I'm looking forward to a vibrant discussion but before I call upon my fellow panelists to share their thoughts, I just thought uh, let us look at the bigger picture in order to put the deliberations in context. And what we see today in India is nothing short of a revolution which is already around us, which has uh, completely transformed the way Everything is being done, but particularly payments, how, how they have been evolving. And uh, having been in the field of uh, risk, financial risk, etc., in my earlier avatar, I have seen the incidents changing from check frauds to what we had earlier, some, some time ago, as a bank being attacked and that is the background we are looking at 
that the way payments are being done where they will move is changing rapidly but so is the the element of risk in that and the job of security professionals is to ensure that the risk is contained minimized eliminated and trust goes up so that the real benefit of having good payment system is available to everyone in india we look at a very diverse population where some of the population is already using the latest uh, payment uh, solutions and if you were to read some of the social media and the online mentions one would think that bitcoin investing though i don't consider it a payment system but just a advanced fintech product legitimate or otherwise is so high and there is so much clamor about allowing it or you know facilitating it that one would think that uh, you know most of the indians already know about it but the reality is that today when you come for the conference you want to pay the cab driver you have very limited options and if you travel 50 kilometers away from delhi you will have to carry cash wads of cash if you are wanting to buy a few things and friend etc so we live in a country which is primarily cash driven which primarily ill uh, acquainted with financial systems a lot of this is urban phenomenon but the challenge is to look at financial inclusion as the uh, overall objective of payment innovation making payment simpler encouraging digit digitalization of transactions and enabling build up of credit profiles easy availability of credit so it is all linked to payment system is the circulatory system for the financial system and as people get connected to it it improves ease of business financial inclusion empowerment of the poorest people and so on so that is a big picture at least i would like to paint and then come to the problem of payment innovations and then security of those uh, innovations around those innovations so with this uh, uh, thoughts i uh, wanted to call upon my fellow panelists to talk about what they are doing uh, in their own areas uh, briefly and uh, how security is something they are addressing in their own areas of activities and uh, in terms of following a logical sequence i think uh, i will first call upon rajendra who represents uh, npci or uh, who has understanding of the npci critical role in the payment innovations happening and uh, share his thoughts uh, 3 minutes is what we have agreed upon so rajendra you are next very good morning uh, to all of you uh, in uh, technology uh, the way it is uh, evolving and the way rapidly it is moving so uh, it's definitely a big challenge uh, for all of us and uh, we have been uh, innovating a lot of uh, new products uh, but uh, what i feel from security perspective it's the challenge is uh, more on to the controls uh, that needs to be in place and uh, necessary frameworks that needs to be uh, also available so why innovations are, are going on but at the same time uh, secure uh, frameworks which will help at uh, the guidelines uh, impacts uh, uh, or security measures that needs to be taken needs to be uh, addressed and quickly uh, need to be in place <coughs> that is one second uh, why the innovations are in place uh, the the main uh, device that is your handset that's that's mobile it's like you know via which you actually do all the payments and uh, the transactions and all uh that it's a like you know, a guideline needs to be developed so that why all this technology innovations are happening there has to be a collaborative efforts so that the uh, end user doesn't suffer any loss so that's in short sir 
Okay, I think uh, I will come to it with more, more provocative questions. But uh, uh, I think the role of standards, the centralized way of dealing with security is going to be always important. And we'll revert to that in a short while. But uh, uh, may I request uh, Shiari to talk about what he is doing uh, in his role in terms of innovation and in security in been with uh, Airtel also uh, pre uh, prior to this uh, uh, setting up uh, the initial wallets in India right so uh, in uh, Reliance Payment Solutions Limited uh, I take care of the CISO functionality as well as take care of the security engineering also uh, in last uh, in fact in this current RPSL itself you know uh, in five years the objective of I mean the wallet actually you know what is uh, the services actually or use cases initially you know thought of I mean, have been changing in last uh, five years uh, so if you look at uh, uh, last many years uh, there was actually a kind of uh, rigid sense in India that uh, uh, the cash will be the king uh, even though actually you, know, you want to move into a kind of uh, payments platform like credit card debit card etc the acceptance platform is not there but all this has changed uh, you know when uh, uh, the uber asian or ola actually has come and actually you know the digital payment started kicking in that people are actually willing to pay you know through uh, digitally and with the uh, with the smartphones penetration and all uh, it has become now you have more channels actually today you don't really you know go anywhere to do the payments like you know whether it's utility payments bus ticket booking, flight ticket booking, hotel booking and you know transferring someone you know, money or having some party and splitting the bills etc. There are so many things actually you know which we are doing basically. So, so what is security engineering in my uh, view is that uh, why CISO is responsible for confidentiality, integrity, availability and authentication and access controls. The security engineering aspects are completely you know uh, different. Uh, what uh, if I align myself to the business properly, the security engineering objectives will be zero authentication, I mean not literally means actually the experience for the customer is actually you know, that uh, there is no authentication for you. Uh, so I mean uh, you yourself actually see that today we don't uh, you know earlier we used to draw the pattern on the android phone or you know uh, give the pin etc on the phone but today you know you lift the phone and it will recognize your face and actually do the authentication and uh, which is actually more secure than you know something remembering your password or the pin to uh, you know authenticate uh, yourself right the same thing with the uh, 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 digital payments also that uh, the innovative methods in authentication actually proving to be better than uh, uh, the traditional methods of password etc second thing is seamless access to the funds doesn't matter where you are uh, and what you are doing, whether you have a phone, whether you don't have a phone, uh, you should be able to access to your funds, you should be able to make the payments, you should be able to you know, gain. Uh, so, payment should not be a hindrance for buying an ice cream when you are going out with your child, right? You should be able to enjoy your services, payment should be seamless. Third thing is, there should not be any incident. That means like, you know, we are tend to, we, how many times we count our wallet that how much money you spent, how much money you have actually kept etc. But in the wallet, if 10 rupees difference is there, the customer is not going to leave you, right? And incidents is not just about losing a money, it's about you have to get some loyalty points or uh, you know, something. It has to be maintained, integrity, etc. Now, like if you deserve some 50 rupees of cash back, you should get it, you know, irrespective of uh, yeah. And third thing is privacy, right? That no matter actually how many channels, maybe thousands of channels you are actually making the payments, no one likes that your behavior or your personal information to be shared to anyone else. 
the security engineering objectives are this and they are working on that and there are a lot of regulations also around that. So uh, all this actually this is actually not for making the digital payments more acceptable and uh, you know and growth etc. Thanks, Ravi. Uh, I think that it's interesting to hear about frictionless authentication and privacy because the one and the uh, easy access funds. I think that there are some interesting uh, topics that will come back. But uh, I would now request Bharat uh, to talk about his role uh, of building technology for a new generation. digital, frictionless, and effective payment systems. And that, I think, is a phase shift that is very exciting for all of us, for me personally, and I think that's what we're trying to do at Intel Payments Bank. And as an industry, RBI seems to have given us that uh, right direction, that financial inclusion, payment habits at scale, are something that we still haven't achieved in India, and the Payments Bank and other uh, initiatives that IP RBI is driving are brilliant examples that the regulator is helping India in this context. And I think that's the exciting part. So what does that entail? Like everything else, we all believe that this phase shift in payments is going to happen with technology. It is about, when we talk about engineering, what is it? It's a set of problems that we want to solve, a set of tools and constraints that we have, and building solutions within this framework. What are our challenges? Our challenges are going to be ensuring effective payments, extreme simplification and convenience for customers, but at the same time, balancing the cross balances which are ensuring that this convenience does not come at the cost of security. I want to provide extremely convenient payment mechanisms for my customers without losing trust and without losing security. Right? And that, I think, we, is what we're all solving for. And that's the engineering problem, or that's how we're trying to engineering, engineer security here. And I believe in the next couple of years, we'll be seeing the space shift happening thanks to all the technology and innovations that we're looking at. Very exciting time for all of us. And uh, security and trust are the basis on which the space shift, I believe, will happen. And our uh, consumers sitting in rural areas, r remote areas of India, have already shown 
that give them the right kind of tools, give them the right kind of opportunity, they're going to consume whatever you provide to them. Digital content, for example, is already a success story. And we're looking at a similar phase shift in payments technologies and payment services, and that's what is exciting for all of us. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Sharad. Uh, I think he touched upon the challenge of uh, how customers are already using technology in other areas. For example, the mobile phone, whether it's a feature phone or a smartphone, is now being used you know, in, in the most effective manner for which it was initially intended, which is the voice communication part. But if you look at the popularity of a platform like WhatsApp and the kind of uh, uh, impact it has made on big uh, uh, events in our public life, which is elections and so on, one can appreciate the potential which is there. But I think like electricity in nature occurs in, uh, in, in a very raw form and it has to be understood and then you know, converted into something which can be used and converted into a uh, uh, utility, etc. I think we need to look at how the raw power of technology is to be converted into something which an ordinary customer can use. And I would like to uh, now request Bharat to tell us more about what he is doing to convert this raw power of technology into providing something which is very tangibly useful for an end customer. Bharat, if you can elaborate. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so I'm going to talk about it in slightly two different components. Right? One, I'll talk about it from the user community. So to give you a little bit of brief, uh, I'm one of the startup companies, Minzip. Uh, we kind of really have a financial app which aggregates people's finances and kind of really gives recommendations in terms of what they should be doing with money. Most of the people are busy in their lives. They don't get good quality of advice. And this app pretty much say outsource your thinking about money and we tell you what you need to kind of really be doing. Now, when it comes to the whole payments, right, you know, there are two things, as I said, from the user community and the startup community. From the end user community, while we sitting on the other side understand that, hey, there's a lot of security controls that are kind of really doing their best industry standards that are being implemented, uh, there is always this fear in the user's mind, right? And today, more than, even before the new technology gets rolled out into the market, even before the standards for the new technology gets laid down in the market, there is enough videos that are getting circulated in the WhatsApp groups in terms of what potential risks that are associated with it. I'm sure many of us would have watched a video about uh, NFC where people are able to take the money out of the wallet from the person's pocket even before realizing, you know, without the person realizing. Now, you know, technically and practically there are tremendous number of challenges for enabling that, uh, for <coughs> that kind of an incident happening. And sitting on this side, you know what the controls that are kind of really put in place. But from an average customer perspective, they are worried about two things. One, you know, is embracing new technologies risky, right? And what does that do to my money? And two, which is a much bigger concern, is should there such an incident be happening? What is my recourse? Who is the person who I should be approaching to? Because there are so many intermediaries out there. Who is responsible for solving my problem? And that's that's a big concern. And as we kind of really work through identifying the various standards and controls, I think it's important we also need to focus a lot more on communication because that's an integral piece to articulate what we are doing and how it is safe enough for the people to be able to adopt technology. So that's one from the user and we will talk a little bit more about it in the subsequent conversation. The second is more around the startup, right? Today we all agree that while there is innovation happening in primary enterprises, there is also a tremendous amount of innovation that is happening of these enterprises in the startup world, uh, especially within India, too, in the fintech sector. And in, I kind of really meet with wide number of startup founders, you know, colleagues uh, who is doing who are doing amazing work. But the, once again, the, while the primary uh, focus is how do I build this great user experience or a great feature that would benefit the end customer, what? not enough number of people are focusing upon is that this action of providing the service is as much as it is a service delivery, it is about building trust. It's important that the customer should be able to kind of really have trust within the app or within the service to kind of really embrace it. And that requires a completely different paradigm in terms of communication. So today, if you are asking for a permission uh, from a, you know, uh, of a certain level of permission uh, you know, from the customer to enable this service, 
We should also have the flexibility for that customer to recall that permission at any point in time, right? And what, what I feel is we need to, as much as we are educating the customers, educating the folks within the enterprises, it is equally important to educate the startup founders and others who are working in these spaces of the strict security standards and the privacy standards that need to be implemented so that while they are architecting the products, those become an integral feature and not an add-on subsequently, right? And I think more and more we educate the startup founders, I think we will be able to align the innovation that people have got with the best security standards to enable a better service that we deliver to the customers. And we need to embrace these startups because without that, the adoption that we are kind of really talking about is not just going to happen. And that education is a critical component. Thank you, Will. I think uh, very interesting themes coming out. Customer protection, one, educating the entrepreneurs and uh, the granular and revocable permissions. I think that's a great idea from the theme that is the engineering, security and payment innovations. But I think uh, to minimize the wasteful effort which goes into building an ecosystem without any standards or any common picture of how things are required to be done, uh, we, we have on our panel a, a representative from one of the standards uh, bodies and uh, we have been having some interesting conversations so I would request uh, Nitin to share his thoughts on this. Uh, thank, thank you, sir. sir. Very good morning to all of you. So I come from uh, Payment Card Industry Data Security Standards Council and uh, I have taken up this role in the country uh, just two months back. Uh, as you all know, the PCI standards has been in existence for almost half a decade and uh, the standard keeps evolving and uh, the focus of the PCI uh, is on protecting the card payments. Or what I would say is that card based payments, let me just correct myself this. So wherever we have the card data or the card based payments happening and where the organizations or the businesses are storing, processing and or transmitting the, the payment information are required to go through the, the PCI standards. So I think uh, that's the, the key focus that uh, we are having and uh, the standards are evolving and currently uh, we started with the, the base foundation of the standard was PCI VSS. Now we have 12 different standards. Uh, which are uh, which can be used by the, the businesses to protect the payment data. Uh, and uh, as you know that the industry is evolving and we talk about the innovations happening and, the, the, and uh, we are talking about the, the moving towards uh, the contentless payments where you don't need a, exactly you need a card to make payments and that's where the council is also aggressively working on different new standards uh, which will help you in, in protecting those, uh, those payment forms. And, uh, and there has been always a question around with you know, who all can follow the PCI standard. So, so what we have seen basically the focus being on the card payments, card based payments is uh, we have seen globally uh, there is a trend that the organization has been using in principal requirements of the PCI standards to protect the other forms of the payments and the data or the information. So, so I think that's where I come from. It's that you know the organizations can use the PCS standards and uh, they can effectively try to implement those requirements to protect those uh, payment data. Uh, coming back uh, on uh, the involvement, you know, I think, see, industry, uh, how we see is evolving and there's, there's a lot of innovation, there's a lot of payments, forms which are coming up. And we would need on a global basis the feedback from the, from the industry and that feedback is, is really important for the, for the standards body like us to uh, to evolve the standards, make them robust, more robust what we are today and uh, try to get them in a shape where uh, the industry can start using them, implementing them in an effective way and in order to be there we need to get the people trained, the awareness has to be created, the adoption of the standards has to be more uh, within the industry uh, so that you know we can, we can more protect these uh, card based payments. Uh, I, I think that's what for now, to start with, uh, I'll hand over to Mr. Nath and take further discussion. Thank you, Nitin. I think uh, this is quite a challenge that we see. Innovation is uh, so rapid that any standards necessarily have to follow that innovation. But without standards, some of the innovation is also not like to be very productive. So it's a 
little bit of an interplay there and uh, it, it's very exciting because the ability to see in future and build that, that uh, rules of the game around that is something which really is interesting. Uh, but I would like to come back to Rajendra because he uh, escaped to do a very short introduction and would like to ask him, uh, given NPC has a preeminent position in the payment space, uh, firstly, is there uh, something uh, uh, NPC is doing for setting uh, uh, you know, any expectations uh, to the ecosystem around the new innovations, UPI being some of the, one of the biggest ones? Uh, and uh, then if, if NPC is doing something special about securing the, the hub itself, uh, so if Rajendra you could shed some light on that. Sir, while uh, NPCI has been uh, 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 an innovative organization, uh, it, it is definitely a challenge uh, while the other players get connected to us. So, it's very important that uh, the controls, the security controls which they are implementing and the via which they are getting connected to us uh, is something uh, the need of the R, uh, the, the security of it. Because what happens is, if you have seen the recent attacks, it has not been something creative or something out of the box. It's purely a simple security uh, guidelines which we have been practicing for us in uh, 20, 20, uh, 20, 25 years. So probably an access control. Uh, uh, secondly, related to patch management. So these attacks, if you relate and if you really uh, come it down, so it's really related to access control and uh, the patch management people have not followed it with the uh, recent banks attacks as well. So for us, it is very important to uh, give across a, a, a guideline uh, to them that were what needs to be implemented. Plus, uh, the PCI standards which more the card industry is following, I, I believe the uh, assessments related to it it becomes very helpful uh, that uh, the organizations follow it uh, religiously. I am saying religiously so that because if it is followed religiously then probably the controls would get in place because we Indians believe in God a lot and we follow a lot of religions, right? So from that perspective I would say. And uh, uh, at the same time while we uh, in, uh, interact with most of the organizations and when they uh, connect to us, we ask for security guidelines, certain processes that follow that you know, vulnerability assessment, penetration testing reports, application security reports, the code review reports also. So while the, the regulatory bodies are also working with us like RBI, certain the National Critical Infrastructure the, uh, team, so these guidelines and the regulators uh, really help us to cater to uh, the PSPs, ASPs who connect to us and help us, uh, like you know, provide a particular service. So from that perspective, that is really helpful. Plus, at the same time, if there are any frauds and all that happening, if the bank, we work very closely with the banks also. If there are any alerts related to the frauds that happen, we communicate with the with the banks. At the same time, the banks, uh, the certain RBI also uh, generate uh, IDRBT has uh, formed groups where any secure incidents that are happening, so all this, the details are also getting captured and shared across to all the banking sector as well. So while it is just evolving and people have understood the, the implications related to it, I, I believe the, that is really happening um, in the right direction, sir. Thank you, Rajendra. Uh, I would urge you to put in your questions on the Slido site. In, in case uh, you have any questions, please use the Slido site, site which was uh, initially mentioned. Uh, Slido.com and then the code is uh, M721, M971. So please feel free to put the questions. I am seeing questions, some questions directed at uh, RBI. So I just wanted to put in a disclaimer here that uh, I am the Chief Executive Officer of the Reserve Bank Information Technology Private Limited. So it is not RBI, it is a RBI captive which provides services to RBI. I am here in my capacity as ex CEO of the SCI probably and a fellow uh, security professional. So don't expect any RBI related answers to come from me. I just thought I would put in a uh, disclaimer here. But coming back to the you know the 
the ecosystem of uh, this whole hardware supply chain, the uh, software code writing standards as of now, the need to scale up fast. My question to my co-panelists from uh, Reliance Geo and Airtel Payment are, how do you see uh, these challenges playing out? Are they critical? Are they being overcome? Is there a skill problem? If you can elaborate uh, from your point of view, uh, what are the challenges and how they, they can be overcome? I think over the years, uh, there's a lot more cognizance of need for security and also what is needed from a security perspective while we're building stuff. I think during the early days of uh, information security, a uh, lot of organizations used to actually build products and think of security as an afterthought, as a burden that you have to do auditing and other stuff. But I think, at least I see right now, that the industry and regulators and organizations have moved to a stage where we realize that just taking a product out to the market is not the most important thing. You take the market the product out to the market and then realize security issues, the damage is much larger. And at least within ATL and uh, other organizations that I've been working with, we make security a key aspect of development and instead of making it a testing practice, we sort of now make it a development practice. So we train our developers in information security needs. We train our developers in uh, compliance uh, needs. So that from day one, when we are thinking about a product, we are thinking about how would somebody else break this? And how can I make sure that I build it right from day one? Uh, so some of the things that, for example, that we do is, uh, as the product is being built, in some cases, we've done some practices like uh, bringing in developers together, developers, testers, and our C uh, security team together, and do, how would a hacker break this kind of events? We found that extremely exciting. The developers and others were sometimes amazed to see that what they're building could actually be broken in a particular way. And that was uh, eye-opening for the developers. And then we started seeing developers asking, what do I do to get trained on this? And um, I think our CISO, um, and risk teams have done a brilliant job in ensuring that compliance training happens, security training happens. So I think that is a important aspect and we're seeing some very good successes with that. Because after putting in all the effort, we realize then that security issue is there and we have to pull the product back is a complete disappointment for everybody. And hence security has to be thought about from day one. Compliance has to be thought about from day one. And uh, there is investment needed, there is time needed that's the right way to work. But, but if I can uh, urge you further, do you see any challenges going forward in any area, areas, people process technology? Um, I think, see, there are a lot of new technologies that are coming out. Um, there are challenges in the sense that when you use a new technology, we don't necessarily understand it extremely well. And hence, it needs that extra effort and time in the, from the organization to ensure that the people are trained. I think that training on security aspects is extremely critical. And making it upfront is an investment, but an important one that we have. It's really, you, any thoughts on challenges? Yeah, right. Uh, so, the, uh, I don't really talk about the shortage of the manpower as the, you know, as a skilled manpower as a problem. That, that's my problem and that's the industry problem. Uh, there's one aspect is that uh, the ever uh, changing uh, technology and regulatory environment, right? Technology environment is actually when initial wallet has been built, it has been built on some, you know, initially hybrid model, some restful APS, then it's moved to some native, then actually we have containerization, DevSecOps. So there is a problem for the security team uh, that this, uh, the technology models keep changing that the security team also has to, you know, uh, catch up with this changing, uh, you know, platforms and actually what is the security implications of that. Second thing is the business context is changing. So earlier actually, you know, uh, I remembered actually when I built my first wallet, we have been so paranoid about the security that there is end-to-end -end encryption, what's not actually. So today when I told about this, seamless authentication has been more effective than the traditional authentication of password, etc. And another business context changing is that uh, security teams may not like it. For example, when I was young, when I go to the shop, right? 
the shop below i just see my face and just let me take the things you know he will collect the money from uh, you know my dad later right applying the same business context here in the payments also so what are the security challenges right there is a security guy understands it it takes time to really you know uh, uh, agree with the business team saying that oh this kind of things happens for example the ready credit to the merchants right <laughs> so money will be going out <laughs> but money has to go out to make the money right so applying in this business context changing is also you know uh, it uh, you know security team has to catch up with that the other part is actually the developers uh, dichotomy is there's a pca dss requirement the specific way of implementation right there is a aadhar related security requirement vaulting you know uh, the encryption there is a you know kind of uh, virtualization card right there so many things actually which they are not able to catch up right the testing team do the testing there is a functional testing of multiple rounds happens then the security team comes up again we actually tell the people that you have to fix this again the functional testing happens etc so in this we have taken two things that we keep regularly regularly training the developers you know on the uh, this different requirement like pca dss tss very prescribed this 10 15 requirements that how do you handle the card end to end you know very technological in the language they understand that we actually train them in advance and when whenever the aadhar regulator comes up we actually take those things and we tell them that this is a specific way of implementation sometimes we even you know uh, get into a brainstorming that how effectively it can be implemented for example a token has to be created it can be a random number also right instead of really going through a hash and you know, adding the padding and all these things and then mapping and all. so we security engineering actually one of the requirement is that we work with the developers and uh, sometimes develop the solutions uh, together third thing is actually that trying the testers also the basic security checks actually you know uh, security team do not uh, need not waste their time actually in doing the basic checks of whether authentication bypass is possible you know we can put some malicious parameters in the input right uh, and whether the role based access control can be you know bypassed this is the 10 15 checks we train them and we'll give a very simple you know uh, a language understandable by a 10th class uh, guy right with the basic things so that the some of the security basic security things actually can be you know uh, addressed and uh, doing the functional testing itself so another thing i want to point out here actually nitin actually when i was uh, casually talking we build layers of security assessments uh, you know uh, in uh, coming out with a product right initially it will be engineering then actually testing then regulatory you know compliance then external compliance internal audit compliance so many things so uh, why not actually build you know for example qsa has to come from outside and what if you know if there is an internal uh, isa actually what has been proposed that there is some people actually work together closely with us and actually we can cut down this layers of security assessment security building etc if we work collaboratively together and you know and that's what actually devs apps you know and it's mostly uh, a, a development paradigm actually where uh, you know which will cut short this security assessment but overall uh, you know if we can cut the layers and actually external and internal bodies work together along with the product life cycle and uh, with by applying the business context you know it will be you know great to help us right. in my view so i think uh, integrated approach collaboration uh, working together devs apps ex- excellent uh, inputs but i think one uh, thing probably which many times gets missed out is the privacy of the customer data which is getting generated and which will be leveraged so uh, my question to uh, bharat is about he is in the space of collecting a lot of information and then using it to provide very uh, granular advice so how do you address privacy expectations and how do you what how do you build security controls around those Uh, I would say that there are two ways to kind of really do it. And I'll talk about what we are doing, but I'll also talk about what the general issues are with different startups, right? But let me talk about first what we are kind of really doing. I have been in the financial services industry for 25 years, so when we kind of really started really building our product, you know, we started, and I would say pretty much we built, a pr- we started building the product about a year back, and in an era where the data privacy becomes extremely important, right? So. we started architecting the product with the data security and the data privacy at the core uh, you know for example our product pretty much is currently targeted and restricted to the indian market and that's where we are kind of really offering but we said okay what are the best privacy standards that are available in the world and we went and said okay gdpr 
is the best European Union uh, has come out with that privacy standards. Let's kind of really bring that and implement that in our architecture as we kind of really doing it. And what are the best data security controls uh, that are out there? And we, what we do is as a product, we actually get a third party agency to test our product for data security almost every month to potentially identify any breaches because we understand that at the end of the day if there is a breach happening, we don't have a business, right? And that's extremely critical. So you need to kind of really make that as a number one priority for us to be able to do that. And that's something we do it. So therefore, for our people, when they come onto our app, they have the complete freedom to define which accounts to be tracked, which accounts do not want to be tracked, what data they want to be retained, what data they do not want to be retained, what permissions could be given, what permissions could be taken out. A lot of that we have put in and we are continuing to evolve. So that's that's a critical component because for me personally it's a trust building. Unless until you can gain the trust of the customer, we will not be staying in this business for a long term. So I always tell my team, we got to help people, but we got to help people at the pace that they are comfortable with. Let's not try to kind of really go ahead and say, okay, we will do all of this. So that's one thing, right? So that specifically what we are doing. But I also give a perspective about a little bit about what's happening in the whole entrepreneurship world, right? In terms of the various startups that are out there. Uh, it's very easy, sometimes we tend to kind of really sit on the other side and say, okay, why aren't they putting a lot of security controls? Why aren't they putting a lot of uh, elements, right, from day one and so on? You gotta kind of really look at the life of an entrepreneur and a young guy who is kind of really starting off, who is passionate about trying to kind of really solve a problem. Uh, we all understand, especially this room would definitely understand, and as Mr. Sharad has also indicated, you know, there's a lot of compliance elements that we need to kind of really build into the products, right? And these compliances are costly. There is a cost of compliance. The compliances doesn't come kind of really free. Now, take an entrepreneur who is passionate about building a product and has limited set of funds to start off with because that's where they're starting off the journey. They don't have significant banking. And if you look at the Indian ecosystem of venture capital and uh, you know uh, angel investors, most of the cases, I would say in all of the cases, most of the cases everybody says, launch your product, gain some traction, come to me, then I will kind of really fund it. That's been the regular, the regular mindset, right? People don't say, oh, I love your idea, let me start funding you a little bit, you build it out, and then we will kind of continue to do it. Most of the cases, people will say, okay, what traction do you have? Have you released the product? Have you kind of really do it? Now, for the entrepreneur, even if the person understands, hey, some, you know, they need to prioritize where to spend the money and how to kind of really put that money in. And their urge is always, how do I put the money to take the product, gain initial set of customers, prove that out to uh, you know the investors, raise funds, and then I know I need to build some of these security controls. I will come back, I will start building it out in the subsequent set of layers. So while the large companies have the comfort of imposing some of the security controls before releasing their product to the market, Many of the entrepreneurs face this dilemma. Some people are not aware of this, which is understandable, but there are others who are aware of it, but are also caught in this dilemma between, okay, how do I get traction, raise money, and build it out, or do I build it out and go to the market? And there's a significant dilemma that most entrepreneurs face, right? I don't think so there is a solution right now as it is, but I want to kind of really bring that appreciation to this group. I think this is the important point, and innovation always wants to get things done in a hurry. And obviously there is a regulatory regime which also needs to be observed. So the uh, concept of regulatory sandbox is something which we have been hearing about. RBI's annual report also talks of it. So we'll see some regulatory innovation around uh, in that area uh, in times to come. Uh, that's to be expected. I think we are running uh, out of the time which we had. Uh, but I had a very quick uh, question for uh, Nitin. About is there need for any India specific standards around payment? Uh, yeah, I think uh, it's a very straightforward question. But uh, let me let me answer this question. But I just want want to add something on what. No, no, you you are given only two sentences. Yes or no? And, and so no. I think we PCI is a global standard, and uh, as I rightly said in the starting is that PCI in principle has been followed. The standards requirement has been followed globally and. Uh, and if, you, if there is a requirement from the PCI standards which requires to be followed, I think the other forms or other payment forms can be, uh, they can, you know, I, I would actually ask them to and encourage them to follow the standards. Right. So I think that's there. And uh, the involvement from the Indian businesses is very much required to develop the standards to take them to the next level. And, um, and that involvement can only happen, you know, once we all come together, collaborate and try to, you know, uh, influence the standards from 
the Indian context. Right. No, I'm sorry, I didn't want to uh, yeah. cut you out, but uh, we are running out short of time. Yeah. But in glo in the cyber world, we see standards which are global, right? We don't have yeah. left hand drive, right hand drive here, uh, luckily. So hopefully, we'll come to that uh, universally acceptable standard around payment security, around new products as well uh, in in new course. But let me go to the audience questions, and uh, the question which has garnered most votes is. Uh, why are mobile payment apps asking for many privacy critical permissions from users who install that could be misused? Are there any RBI other guidelines? So uh, I'm not going to talk about RBI guidelines. That is up to you to research and interpret. But uh, we have uh, entrepreneurs who have been launching mobile apps. So why, why are your apps asking so many permissions? I would agree with the, sometimes there is this uh, euphoria of okay, let's take all of the permissions and all of the data which I think is not right uh, at the end of the day one thing you know we believe and this is something that we need to kind of really articulate there are three things that needs to be happening one we need to be very clearly be able to articulate what permissions we seek and why that should give the flexibility second therefore the user has a choice whether to give that permission or not and if they give the permission we should be able to articulate this is what you can do this is what you cannot do and third users should have the ability to be able to revoke the permission at any point in time i think these are the three standards that needs to kind of really be set in are they there no most of the times people say okay it's easy let me can definitely get the data and we will use the data for a purpose of time in the future I think to a certain extent some of the Sri Krishna Commission report standards that's kind of really coming out indicate you need to articulate what is it for why and then you also need to notify before you start using it. I think some of those best standards will start coming in but I do agree that not everyone uh, requires all the permission. Okay, I my son does some Android programming and I ask him the same question. He says, so Google allows so we collect kind of thing so that is the thing. But coming to the second question, uh, why we are not seeing implementation of two-factor authentication for card-based online payments outside of India? Uh, I think I will take that question because probably it, it's the external ecosystem outside India which probably has to evolve to the level and uh, having been associated with the financial industry for the last 10 or 40 years, I saw how the online frauds rose and th th that was the time when uh, Kingfisher was in business and they were the ones which were seeing maximum frauds because they would no, do no checks at the counter not seeing the card which has been used for booking the transaction because the counter staff was told that every guest is like MD's guest and so on so a lot of fraud there and that is the time around when this two-factor authentication for online transactions came in as a regulation in 2009 and uh, that was uh, you know, in a way a regulatory uh, anticipatory step and that has really worked very well in India. But outside, I think things are still evolving. So probably that it will reach there in due course. But in any case, the liability regime is such that if the customer is using card on a site outside India and there is a fraud, the merchant is the one who bears the loss. So the customer is not, not at, at loss. And uh, I will just take one more audience question. Uh, do you think two-factor authentication is secured enough? So any technologists wanting to answer that? Uh, do you think two-factor authentication is secure enough? Yeah, so today, uh, I mean, actually, so people draw the lines between, you know, my business also draws the line between, uh, you can actually log into Google without any authentication, uh, those things, but payments are different and email is different. Uh, but uh, the idea is that uh, uh, how to make the seamless authentication using the existing technology available, right? Password is very cumbersome. When I try to, you know, onboard a, a roadside flower seller, you know, into using the geo money, uh, he has to remember the password with special characters and all these things, and also mother's maiden name and all. He don't understand. Even he don't even know the date of birth, right? That uh, so two things actually happening. One is. Uh, you know, the device binding, actually, that which is transparent, which you may not be knowing. Today, any other banking uh, app you use, it does the device binding. That means uh, only from that phone, actually, if you, uh, from that phone, actually, you can use the mobile app. 
there is something called jadelia actually which uh, you just said there is an header enrichment program happens so through the uh, telecom operator actually we identify that which phone actually he is using which mobile number he is using so that way the tra- authentication becomes transparent and second factor is actually using the, the simple m pin kind of thing which is also which is effective so that acts as the second factor authentication with this uh, the two factor authentication is very effective uh, in our experience but apart from that there is something called uh, uh, risk based authentication and adaptive authentication for example if i go to the same uh, shop and having lunch of 30 rupees i don't need to re- redo the authentication actually whenever i make some 30 rupees payments uh, to that person right whereas uh, you know if my spending pattern is you know extremely varying that suddenly i had a lunch here and i'm having some dinner in bihar and all that's where actually there is a step up authentication etc happening so with this actually you know uh, the two objectives i said engineering this one uh, making uh, you know authentication as uh, less painful as possible and uh, also uh, allowing the seamless authentication in so this i want to sorry so I, i think uh, no we are running out of time so i think if i can summarize two factor authentication implemented well is secure enough oh, good so as uh, you know we had a uh, uh, vibrant discussion and uh, you know, some audience questions were also answered but i think the takeaway is that uh, i mean all of us know this security is not a easy problem to solve and it requires uh, various elements to come together to really then create that uh, sense of uh, uh, trust which is what the customer is looking at is not looking for security is looking for trust and how to build that trust is the job of i think all the stakeholders in the ecosystem starting from the regulators who have of late come out with uh, customer protection guidelines so the customer is completely protected if the customer has is not at fault in any transaction the banks have to take responsibility banks have the wherewithal to take the responsibility the other players in the ecosystem the service providers the uh, the fintech inno- innovators uh, i think they also need to keep security in mind at the design stage itself so that the work is minimized later and it is not an afterthought which is very expensive and the role of standards then is becomes very important because that is the way to really uh, be very economic with your resources but still achieve the same impact so i would like to thank my co-panelists for uh, sharing their thoughts and uh, uh, you know uh, i think they they have a fantastic uh, opportunity to contribute to something which is the big goal and uh, we look forward to uh, you know uh, this discussion helping you in uh, many ways and so on so thank you very much for your attention thank you everybody thank you sir. thank you sir and uh, i believe that audience has a good value addition from today's session we would like to again thank mr nand kumar sarvade ceo repet mr rajendra bhairo head information security npci mr sharad chandra cio oh, sorry ptto airtel payment bank mr nitin bhatnagar associate director pci security standard council mr shrihari kotni avp reliance payment solution and mr bharat ravuri founder and ceo midsip thank you all thank you